Well, thank you to our readers, and may I add my warm welcome to you, especially if you're here visiting, uh, or for the very first time, it's lovely to have you with us this morning, and I hope this might be the uh, first visit of many for you. Our subject this morning is the achievement of Jesus' death. And I want us to see what it is that Jesus' death accomplished. Matthew concludes his gospel by recording Jesus' commission to every disciple to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. That is the goal of Matthew's writing. But in his gospel, Matthew devotes a great section of his writing to the achievements of the death of Jesus on the cross. And this, by any reckoning, is strange. For the death of a person is the point at which futility, feeble frailty, and ultimate failure is writ large. Many of us have witnessed death at first hand. I remember the day I first encountered death, going to see my grandmother on her deathbed, and then driving away from the funeral, and asking the question, what was the point of all of that? 80 plus years. And yet, as I've considered these verses, the ones we've just had read, I have been increasingly persuaded that Matthew wants us to see that the death of Jesus is the key to his great achievement that is to be proclaimed across the globe by every disciple. And in my preparation, there are three things, at least, that have persuaded me that Matthew is deliberately putting together a section here on the achievement of the death of Jesus, and he's doing it deliberately before he records the resurrection of Jesus, that we might understand the epicenter of the achievement of Christ, to be at his death on the cross. The first thing that persuaded me, very obvious, namely that when reading the Gospels, we should expect as they come to a close that every line now carries all the weight and impetus of the accumulated material thus far in the account. Books don't just whimper out at the end. And so when we read the events recorded in verse 45 to 56, As we read this material, we should bring into the material we read the freight, the weight of everything we've read so far in the gospel. The second thing that has persuaded me that Matthew is recording the achievements of the death of Jesus is perhaps a little less obvious, but did you notice how in verse 52 and 53 what is recorded appears to be misplaced? So Matthew speaks about what happens after his resurrection. And yet he records it at Jesus' death. Why does he do that? The tombs were opened, the bodies of the saints were raised, I take it, following the resurrection of Jesus, and then these bodies appeared. Now whatever you make of that, isn't it strange that it's recorded at the point of his death rather than at the point of his resurrection. That is, unless Matthew is putting together a section of material to show us that the epicenter of the achievement of Christ was actually through his death. And then do you notice that verses 45 to 49 record the death of Jesus, and then 57 to 51 deal with the burial of Jesus, so that the content of 45 through to 51 is to 57 rather, is bracketed by his death and by his burial. That we have a discrete section in Matthew's writing to do with the achievement of his death. Well, I've noticed four features to which Matthew wishes to draw our attention, and you may spot others as we work through it. But the first is this, that at the death of Jesus, the wrath of God is poured out on Christ. And this point is made by the cloud, by the cry, and by the way in which Matthew describes Jesus' final breath. Again, it's surprising. He yielded up his spirit. 
as if intentionally this is the point at which he gave himself up. The cloud of darkness over all the land that we read of in verse 45, the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, is symbolic clouds of darkness in the Bible for judgment. In the book of Exodus, the cloud of darkness is one of the plagues brought in God's judgment. In the book of Amos, Darkness is the mark of God's judgment. On that day I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight, says the Lord. So is the judgment on Israel for her rejection of her king? Well, I think it is. Jesus has already announced woes of God's judgment on the nation. And now God demonstrates his judgment against his people as darkness descends. But... Out of the darkness comes this eerie cry that we read in verse 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. Were you in London in November when the sands from the Sahara blew over England and at two or three o'clock in the afternoon it went, well, pretty nearly dark. And now, from the cross, in the gloom of the three hours of darkness, comes this cry. Is it simply a statement of Jesus' failure to understand what's going on? Why have you forsaken me? Well, I think not. Because from the outset of the gospel, the purpose of Jesus' death has been explained, and from the outset of Jesus' pub throughout Jesus' public ministry, he has anticipated his death on the cross, and throughout chapters 26 and 27, we've been told why Jesus is going to the cross by Jesus himself. So it cannot be that Jesus simply didn't understand what was going on. The cry is sometimes called the cry of dereliction. Could it be simply a cry of despair on the part of Jesus as his desertion by God, speaking of abandonment, of his abandonment by God? My God, my God. Notice the first person singular, still recognizing God as his own personal God. Why have you deserted me? It is a straight quote from Psalm 22, verse 1, and in Psalm 22, we read of the king who suffers on behalf of his people, and we read of their subsequent salvation. And from chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel, we've been told, you shall give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In chapter 20 of Matthew's Gospel, we're told that he will give his life as a ransom for many, and in chapters 26 and 27 of Matthew's Gospel, we're told that Jesus goes as the Passover lamb to carry God's judgment on his people, that he will shed his blood in order to establish a new covenant between God and his people, and that Jesus goes to drink the cup of God's wrath against the sin of the world, that Jesus died as the suffering servant, to carry God's judgment at our sin, so that this cry is a cry at the horror of the world's sin and at the cost of our salvation. And then Matthew is careful to stress, not that Jesus' life was taken from him, he breathed his last, but rather that Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, yielded up his spirit, as he sovereignly gave himself to death, carrying God's judgment at our human sin on the cross. And so this death is a substitutionary sacrifice as Jesus carries God's judgment in our place. And this death is a penal sacrifice as Jesus is punished in our place. And this death is a redemptive sacrifice as through his je death, Jesus satisfies the anger of God at human sin, enabling us to be redeemed. This death is a planned sacrifice. He yielded up his spirit. This death is a willing sacrifice. He yielded up his spirit. And the Easter hymn that we've just sung captures it so beautifully. 
There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. And the Apostle John captures it beautifully. He is the propitiation, that is the wrath-bearing sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. On the cross, as Jesus yielded up his spirit through his death on the cross, God the Son, the Son of God, carried in his body God's wrath and judgment at your sin, your rebellion against God, and mine. The wrath of God is poured out on Jesus Christ at the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, says Jesus. Access to God is now found in Jesus through the cross. Achievement number two, verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The tearing of the temple curtain is a symbolic gesture by God to demonstrate what is taking place. It is of extraordinary significance. It is era-changing. It marks the hinge on which the whole of history turns. The temple was the place of God's presence and of God's pardon and of God's praise. It was at the temple that sacrifices were made to carry God's judgment at human sin. The temple curtain was not simply the sort of thing that you and I hang up in our living rooms to hold out the light. It was a vast, thick, embroidered affair. Alfred Edersheim tells us it was as thick as a man's hand. It was several meters wide and several meters high, and it took between 12 and 20 priests to maneuver it into place. It separated off the Holy of Holies from the main body of the temple, both keeping sinful human beings out of God's presence and shielding the temple worshiper from the presence of God's holiness. And now this temple curtain is torn from top to bottom as the old preachers would say, not from bottom to top, which is something that human beings might have done, but from top to bottom to show that this is God's work. For with the death of Jesus, carrying the wrath of God, the whole temple structure, the entire temple purpose is now redundant. So was the te tearing of the temple curtain to let God's glory out of the temple? Or was the tearing of the temple curtain an anticipation of the total destruction of the temple? Or was the tearing of the temple curtain designed to let human beings into the presence of the glory of God? And I would answer, yes, to every single one of those. One author has it, every barrier between the soul of humanity and the presence of God was removed by the death of the Messiah. For the wrath of God has now been dealt with at the cross. No more need for temple sacrifice. No more need for penance or good works to try and get into the presence of God. God's wrath has been poured out on Jesus. It has been fully satisfied. You and I can now have full and free and open access to God in glorious friendship with our Creator. And given what Jesus has had to say about the temple thus far in the Gospel, and about the law, and about the old covenant, that he would fulfill every aspect of the law and the old covenant through his death on the cross, the temple now is completely redundant. And so this is the hinge on which all of history turns. Because now men and women can have access to God through the death of Jesus on the cross. What was it Jesus said? Looking at the temple, I tell you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And so the tearing of the temple curtain is, if you like, a first fruit of the inevitable end of the temple era. So was the tearing of the temple curtain designed to show us that we can now have free access to God? Yes. 
Was the tearing of the temple designed to show that the nations need no longer go to Jerusalem to find the presence of God? Yes. Was the tearing of the temple designed to show us that God is now accessed through the gospel of Jesus Christ and not through the sacrificial system? Yes. Was the tearing of the temple curtain designed so that we could know, we could have friendship with God because our sins have been forgiven and God's wrath has been poured out on his son once and for all? Yes. Go to the Parliament at Westminster, seek entry to the House of Commons or the House of Lords, access denied. Go to Lord's Cricket Ground, seek entry to the members' stand, unless you're one of a very elite small band, I know one or two of you are, access denied. Go to any one of these major landmark buildings around us today, wanting to go up to the privileged top floor or whatever, well, without extraordinary rigmarole, access denied. Seek to turn left on the aeroplane into that realm of glorious comfort and bliss of business class or whatever it is, access denied. Go to the temple, unless you're the high priest just once a year after copious sacrifice, access denied. Who can enter the holiness of God's presence? But with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, God's just judgment at human sin the sin of the whole world, poured out on Jesus Christ. Free access for those who trust in Jesus Christ. Isn't it glorious? All over the world, the Muslim, the Hindu, the Catholic, the secularist, seeking entrance to some great and glorious future through their own human good works, access denied in and through the death of Jesus on the cross. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, the second great achievement of the cross, access now found in Jesus. Now the third and our very extraordinary verses that we pointed out at the beginning. Look at verse 51b, the second half of verse 51. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, I know this raises many questions. Could it have happened? Who were they? What kind of bodies did they have? What happened to them subsequently? What does it mean? But perhaps most surprising of all, most surprising of all to me anyway, is that Matthew records this event here rather than after his resurrection from the dead. That's the obvious place to record the resurrection and then the resurrection of bodies appearing to many. Surely this is because Matthew is grouping together for us these events, the events that pinpoint what Jesus achieved at the cross so that we grasp that the epicenter of Jesus' achievement the central place at which Jesus achieved the victory was when he died to carry God's judgment at your sin and mine on the cross. Death came into the world as a result of human sin. It was the wrath of God on our human rebellion against God that caused death. Back in Genesis 3, God shut the gate to the garden and put a guard over the tree of life. And throughout the Bible, from that point on, with growing clarity, God provides promise of life beyond the grave. One of the clearest places is in Isaiah 26, where God says, your dead shall live. Their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. The earth will give birth to the dead. There is the great promise of God. Abraham hoped for it. Life beyond the grave. Jacob anticipated it. Life beyond the grave. 
Joseph looked forward to it, life beyond the grave. Isaiah prophesied it, prophesied it. Ezekiel promised it, King David prophesied it, and Jesus delivered it through his death on the cross. If the wrath of God at human sin has been paid for once and for all, and if death is the consequence of God's judgment at human sin, then once Christ has satisfied the wrath of God, resurrection life. It's logical. It's inevitable. The wages of sin is death. As Jesus dies on the cross and carries God's judgment at our sin, inevitably, life. And so we can say that the whole promise of a new creation with a new heaven and a new earth, with physical bodies, demands that logically and inevitably, if Jesus has died on the cross to carry away my sin, then those who trust in Jesus will rise gloriously from the grave. And these resurrection appearances, like the torn curtain, like the cry, are evidences of what is being achieved at the cross. The last time I came face to face, really face to face with death, was when my own father died two and a half years ago. Now, I know he wanted me to take his funeral. I dreaded it for years before his death. And then the day came. And, you know, when a person lies on their deathbed, frailty, futility, finality, many of us have been watching at such moments with great grief. But my father was a true Christian. And actually the day was a glorious day as over 300 people gathered. And as we were able to proclaim the resurrection from the dead. And uh, as we lowered my father into the grave, I was able to say to the gathered assembly, do you know one day he will rise from the grave because the Lord Jesus died to pay God's judgment at his rebellion against God. Death, therefore, is not the end. Do I believe this happened? Of course I do. It had to happen, if you like, as, a, a, as an evidence of the achievement of Christ on the cross, that those in their graves, as a, a sign to us, of what had been achieved, emerged. What kind of bodies did they have? Do you know, I really don't know. Were they resurrection bodies? I just don't know. Were they like Lazarus, just raised for a few moments in order to die again and then to be raised on the final day? I suspect so. Who were they? We just don't know. But we can say that what happened is evidence of the final day, great resurrection that Jesus has guaranteed through his death on the cross to carry God's judgment at our sin. And finally, the great plan and purpose of God through the death of Jesus on the cross. The great plan of God outlined to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12 was that from his line would come one through whom God would bless all nations. Now look at verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. Now this statement by the centurion, a foreign soldier from Caesar's army, is far, far more than simply a comment about who Jesus is or an indication that, oh, well, here is just one individual who put their trust in Jesus. It's much bigger than that. It's pregnant with significance. Because from the outset of Matthew's Gospel, God's promises to Abraham to bless the nations has been in view. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And what do we find at Jesus' birth? Magi come from the east. Here are the nations coming to worship him. And what do we find through Jesus' life? Who comes to kneel at the feet of Jesus, the centurion, the Gadarean demoniacs, the Canaanite women? 
And now as the wrath of God is poured out on Jesus, and as access to God is made possible through Jesus, and as new creation life promised by God is to be found in Jesus, so these centurions represent the people of the nations now recognizing that Jesus Christ is nothing less than God the Son, the Son of God. And the anticipation of the gospel going out to the ends of the world. So these verses, I put it to you, are Matthew's explanation of the achievement of Jesus' death on the cross. Wrath, satisfied, access, enabled, new creation life made possible, the nations brought in. Why does Matthew put it here? Why doesn't it come at the end of the gospel and before the Great Commission and after the resurrection of Jesus from the grave? It's strange, isn't it? Why is it that both Mark and Matthew, most likely the two earliest of the gospels, have so little on the resurrection and so much on the cross? I personally believe Matthew is the earliest of the two of them. Why does Matthew put this material before the resurrection of Jesus? Surely it's to show us that the heart of the achievement of Jesus Christ is worked out in and through his death on the cross. Praise God for it. Is it central in our proclamation of the cross as we take the gospel to the ends of the world? And is it at the heart of our praise and thanksgiving as we approach the Easter weekend and we remember that the wrath of God has been satisfied, that access to God has been made possible, that a new creation world beyond the grave waiting for those who trust in Jesus when he returns is enabled through the death of Jesus on the cross and that now this gospel is to go out across the world, the gospel of the crucified Messiah. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, how we praise you for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that on that cross... He bore in his body, on the tree, your wrath at the sin of the whole world, that he drank the cup of your judgment and drained it. And how we thank you that you have granted to those who trust in Jesus access to you, the living God, freedom to enter your presence by faith, Friendship with God, membership of your family. And how we thank you that death is not the end, that there is life beyond the grave for those who trust in Jesus with you, the living God. And we thank you for giving us this glorious message of the crucified, loving Messiah to proclaim to the ends of the earth. And how we praise you for all the good and joy, and hope, and thanksgiving that flows from it. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.